the street creds is in uh, 2003, I went to complain about the Boston, the Boston Globe about why their editorial section in the print paper and on Boston.com was only written by a certain demographic. It didn't reflect the rest of the world at the time I was talking about women. And they said, great, do you want to blog with for us? This was 2003. And I said, sure, as I usually do. And I walked outside and said, I have no idea what a blog is. So I learned very quickly uh, what a blog was. So I've always been involved a little early on, especially for the industries I'm in. And when I had that organization that Rayco built one of our best chapters down here on the, on the south, um, I say down on the south shore where I live, I'm in, I'm in Boston now, but um, we uh, built the first online network for women, uh, for business women in the United States. Um, we launched it. It was my first, if you build it, they did not come on it. Uh, the only thing that came was a lawsuit from a kid named Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, so. So I've been there, I've been there, I launched a software company, that was another, like, why am I in a software business? I'm actually a marketing and legal person and everything else. So, while I am a COO right now, my love is marketing, branding, and technology. And Tom is speaking up here. Okay. Oh, I have two mics. There we go. See? That's why. Uh, so when I'm talking about trends in communication and design, we're going to take a little bigger picture approach. You'll get some more detail, but I want you to sit back and think. This is a little bit about a... It's, it's a little bit like Marketing 101, a class I never took because we didn't have marketing majors back, way back when I went to college. So, here we go. First, we're going to talk about trends in brand development. And there's three big ones that are happening right now. Uh, you need a full brand experience. In the old days, a brand was the Sears logo. A brand was a logo. A brand might have been a product. I mean, Kleenex was a brand before it became uh, confused with the product that it is. Um, but we want a full brand experience. It's not about... It, Whenever anyone touches your brand, and if you have a blog, especially for a company, that's touching your audience a lot more than a lot of other places. So we're going to be looking at um, the full brand experience. Also, it's about human connection. People need to connect with your brand. They need to understand. They need to feel something. And finally, everything has a brand. Um, we're talking about colleges going forward. Uh, we're sitting here at a, a wonderful uh, Boston University. They have a brand. You know how you know a college has a brand? If your kid will wear it on their clothes before they even get there or after they graduate. So colleges that are not a known brand are going to be struggling. Higher education, and we're seeing a few of those happening already. I just hired an employment brand consultant. This is someone with a little bit of marketing but a whole lot of HR to help craft our employment brand. And that's different than the brand that I'm selling to clients. Because I have an aging industry, and I need to attract uh, young people to our or to our business, which is commercial real estate. So we had to, it's a slightly different brand than our clients, who are actually demographically much older. So we're going to talk about these, but first, what I want to do is step back and think about what makes a great brand. Everybody in here, if you're working on a blog, if you have a blog, if you're working for a company or marketing, this is something that you have to deal with on a set day, whether it's a personal brand or a professional brand. But what makes a great brand? And I'm picking four iconic brands here. Uh, number one is a compelling idea. You need a compelling idea for it to be a compelling brand. But that's just the idea and the vision. Uh, you need the core purpose and the supporting values to really fill out, the, fill out the brand. And next, you need a central organizational principle. I like to call this the filter. It's something that anything you do, anything your, your employees do, anything you write on your blog, or you write on your website, it has to fit that central organizational principle. And finally, you need to have the ability to stay relevant. We're seeing some brands really suffering in this right now as the world has changed. So let's talk about IKEA. IKEA has a very compelling idea. They want to create furniture that everybody can use, that's affordable. Um, and they do this because you can, you can order it, you can pick it up yourself. It's not like a typical showroom when you go to buy furniture and you have to negotiate with the guy and you have to walk around and navigate. Um, here, you know, you pick it out, you put it in your cart, it goes down the, the little slide thing, it goes to your car. Um, or you can mail it, I mean, or you can get it mailed to you. And they are actually trying to make it cheaper, as cheap as possible. One of the things they, they look at is their packaging. They do what's called flat packaging. You're going to see this more and more. They devise it so everything can be flat, which means you have to do a lot of work putting it together. But that goes to their brand. If they shipped it fully put together, they wouldn't be saving you money, which is part of their brand. So some of the things that they're looking at now are a recycling program. So that when you're tired of your college dorm uh, um, items of furniture, some of which I still have a few that look like they're almost that old, um, you can trade them in. And they're going to allow you to 
upgrade. So that's something new. That's trying to stay with their customers for life. That's a pretty compelling idea. They also are starting to work on 3D printing. So when you lose one of those thingamajiggers that connect everything together, they'll be able to 3D print it and, and deliver it to you. Or 3D print it in the store so you can get just that piece. So, so that's their compelling idea, and they've stuck through it. Uh, I am actually a CEO of a franchise. And if anyone's involved in a franchise, if you don't have a compelling idea, they're, and actually I'm bringing this up because IKEA is also a franchise. If you do not have a compelling idea, it's hard to get the franchisees to follow along. Uh, it's not like Virgin Records, whenever Richard rents and buys something, and he just slaps that Virgin name on it, and the next day you're Virgin something or other. Um, we have to actually have a really compelling vision that people want to hop on board, a compelling idea. So IKEA has that one down. Also note at the bottom here, I put brand. A brand also equals quality, vision, and consistency. So you can't do, IKEA, IKEA can't be uh, everyday furniture one day and then high end the next. They have to stick with that vision over time and they have to be consistent. Next, Starbucks. They have lots of compelling ideas, but the, the, most, the, 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 the most important one is that when Howard Schultz decided he was going to develop this place, it was going to be a unique retail experience that creates a third place. That means it's not home and it's not work. It's sometimes you can do work there, or you can uh, meet with your neighbor's work, and you, you can meet with your friends there, or you can sit. Uh, I do some of my best writing in Starbucks. I have no idea why. Starbucks and airplanes. Uh, I like to be around other people, but if I don't have to talk to them, or they won't talk to me, then I can go ahead, do a lot of work. They also wanted to have high quality global coffees. And that's different. That was different way back when. Not everybody here remembers the times before Starbucks, but there was a time. Um, we didn't have good quality coffee. Uh, and, but it also only cost a quarter, 50 cents. Um, but they also had this compelling idea about a connection between their partners and customers. And they call their baristas partners. Uh, so this is, and they pretty much stuck to those compelling ideas. They also had core purpose and supporting values. This is sometimes where they, they go a little in different directions, and some are great. They want to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. Now, some of the stuff they've done is wonderful, uh, treating their employees well, uh, the college stuff, and we all know which one fell flat on its face, which was the race matters. And I think part of the problem is if you put it through, it would, it's a compelling idea, and it fits some of the factors, but if you want to be a, a third place, a safe third place, that's not always the best place to have that conversation, and especially not before I've had my cup of coffee. So I think, and it's a very difficult times in the world. So it was a well-intentioned, but I think if you put it through all the filters that they have here, that one might not have been totally on brand, whereas some of the others were completely on brand and no wonder they were, uh, were um, successful. And just for contrast, you can have the same product with different brands. Now, if Starbucks wants everyone to sit around and relax at their third place, America runs on Duncan. They want you up and they want you going and they're going to get you from the first place to the second place to the third place and then on. And um, I happen to be a Dunkies girl actually, so I like my Duncan brand. Duncan. And this is, but this is really actually very consistent. Does anyone remember their original commercials? What was it? Diamond Ring Donuts. They are always about getting you up and out of the house and get you moving. So they have actually been consistent and they really modernized it. And I'm not sure where they're going with these guys, but it's fun. So they're trying to be fun and they're trying to be uh, appeal to all different age groups. And they've done a really good job. Again, that's a New England uh, franchise brand. So they've done a fantastic job. So, okay, how many Starbucks people in here versus Dunkies? Starbucks? Dunkins. Oh, uh, you know you're in Boston. Yeah, you got an other. Okay, other. I know there's other. Oh, yeah, got some others. All right. So, but think about that. It's the same product. You can have, so a lot of us in here have the same product, have the same services. Um, we can all be website developers and designers, but we can have our own brands. And, and that's going to be compelling to people. Okay, this was my big disappointment when I went to their website to find their central organizational principle. I thought it would be in glaring lights. It would be glowing. It would be so obvious. It would be so great. And I got this. Can anyone spot some of the problems? One of the problems with this is TLDR, too long, didn't read. Um, but it's also that they're mentioning products. Your brand should not, your brand vision should not be a product. It, because things change, market changes. I think iPod is mentioned in here. You know, I mean, you don't want a brand around one single product. Um, so then I looked at it harder and I said, but it's Apple, it's gotta be good, what is it? 
So what I did was a little, I, I just crossed out a whole bunch of words. And then suddenly, this for me screams the Apple brand. Apple designs, Apple leads, Apple reinvents. They define the future. And I think that, for them, is a very compelling vision. And any time that they venture off that, they can stumble um, on the Apple designs. What was the big hoopla when they put a better camera in there and it, it wasn't the smooth, actually, it popped up on the back of the iPhone. And it's like, people were upset about that. Um, like, you know, because Apple has this particular design. Um, I actually sit on the board of a tech toy company and they, and we develop uh, its blocks. It's actually play blocks with capacitive technology, and I'm, this is leading back to Apple, um, that you can go on an iPad. So when your child's first interaction with the iPad is with blocks, which develops motor skills as opposed to kids getting to kindergarten that can only swipe and tap. So, um, but we have a competitor that's sort of a competitor, but they spent so much on designing their packaging so that they could be in the Apple stores. So we're having this big debate. Do we spend the price of the toy we spend on a packaging to fit with the Apple Store. I think we're going to go the independent booksellers, uh, uh, booksellers and uh, games uh, shops instead. But that's something. That's that brand. That company thought about their brand. They wanted to be associated with Apple. They had to spend on the packaging. Apple designs. But even great brands make mistakes. Um, I remember this one. You remember what happened when when they partnered with you 2 and put that on their music and we all lost all that memory space on our, our iPads, uh, they really underestimated that people did not want their music choices pushed at them. I mean, I liked these guys 30 years ago when I saw them in the 80s, but, uh, you know, I didn't want them on my, um, my iPhone now. Uh, they also learned the hard way not to mess with her. <laughs> she is another great brand that's suffering a little this week. But um, she is, if, if people don't, if people recall the Taylor Swift issue was they were giving away their Google Music for free and they weren't going to pay the independent artists. She took them on in an open letter on a blog somewhere and uh, got their attention and they ended up um, quickly paying the independent sellers. So uh, when great brands run into each other, they have to be really honest. So if you have a brand, really try to be inclusive with diversity of thought. Uh, I think when you get to a company, there's a lot of different people. They'd have had some younger generation people on this uh, on this Google Music, which they have now put a new head of Google Music on, and hopefully it's better. I haven't checked it out yet. Um, or not Google Music, Apple Music. So, ability to stay relevant. All right, I'm going to ask for a little shout outs in the audience here. What has McDonald's done in the last couple of years to try to stay relevant? Over here. Make cafe. Make cafe, that's right. Other ones. Breakfast all day. That's my favorite. Yeah, breakfast all day. Others? Food for kids. Healthy food. This is pretty good. Yeah, in fact, the Egg McMuffin all day long, these are the ones that I came up with. Egg McMuffin all day long saved their fourth quarter. Um, so, uh, they do local specialties. If you go in different countries, they will have rice. They will have, even around the country in the U.S., they might have different things. So, they are trying pretty hard. And it's a tough business that they're in. So, okay. So to sum it up, we've got compelling ideas, core purpose and supporting values, central organizational principle, ability to stay relevant. That can make a great brand. But I want to do a little exercise here. Don't worry, you don't have to get up. You don't have to do anything. You just have to think. Here's a definition. Here's the basic definition. This is the one I like the best. A brand is the gut feeling you have when you think about a product or service. It's not the product itself. This is what you want to think about. Your brand, your company's brand, your personal brand. What do people think? about it. So pretend we have a school that is not yet, it's not corporately sponsored. You might get there one day, but it's, schools are not corporately sponsored yet. Um, but I think we can all close our eyes and picture what an IKEA school would look like. Cute little light white wood chairs, um, be really adorable. Uh, although you probably, the furniture would break pretty quickly, you couldn't really move it from one classroom to the other because it would break the process. Um, Starbucks, that's, I think my son's high school is like that. They're all late because his kids are all going to Starbucks and coming in with their coffees in the morning's high school. Um, so, but they're pretty caffeinated. But it might be a little more laid back. You could charge your phone at the table. It'd be great. Um, so unfortunately, we probably feel like this is how some of the schools are being treated at lunchtime already. Uh, but we can picture what that would be like. And of course, we can picture what an apple school would be like. 
So now think about that school, and internally we do this exercise with our company, is what, it, what would um, SVN school look like? And I do this with all our new recruits to see if, what they think of our brand. So it's something to talk about at your company, because the school's pretty neutral, we've all been to one at some point or another, for the most part, um, and you know we can put different brands on it. So I started with branding, and it's that holistic experience. It's everything that people touch, so you have to put it through those filters. Now we're going to talk a little bit more on direct communication, since that's what most of us are involved in here today on this conference. Two big things, two big themes. This is accessibility and credibility. Accessibility. Okay, going back to IKEA. Um, I recently built an addition to my house, and so, of course, at the end of the cycle, you have to put it to furnish it, you have no more money, so you do a lot of IKEA assembly. So this is the front page of every IKEA manual, and one of my friends was helping on a particularly complicated one, and he was like, I don't even know what this means. I'm like, oh, I speak IKEA. And so the top guy tells you which screwdrivers you're gonna need. It says, don't work alone, you need to work with a buddy, don't put it on a hard floor, put a soft mattress underneath, and if you get frustrated, call us before you do something else. So um, they saved themselves how many pages of printing that manual over and over in several different languages. So there are no words. You can go through a whole IKEA manual now, there are no words. It's not that easy, you really gotta get the hang of it. I always, there's always something wrong at one point in time, you have to go undo it. But, um, but learning to speak IKEA, and learning to speak in hieroglyphics is basically, we're actually reverting back hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, here's an example from 2014. A journalist couple tried to only speak in emojis for a whole uh, month. Uh, I don't know if you can read this, but I, I, I presented this at our, our conference, and we had uh, people from Russia and people from um, other parts of the, the world there, and even the Canadians could understand it. But yeah, no, but everybody can understand it. <laughs> so, um, but I just to, in, in case you're not totally understanding this conversation, it's the wife is on the left, and she's saying, my airplane is not going at eight, um, 7 o'clock, it's going to be at 8 o'clock, and I'm at. And he's like, huh, because he didn't get it. And she's saying, well, I'm going to take a plane, but it's not going at 7 o'clock, I think was when it was supposed to go. And then she says, in fact, it's going at 10 now because of the weather. And he's, oh, that's not, that's not great. Ted, really? I mean, that's awful. And so she makes a friendly face, and turtle is slow. And then she says, I'm not going on a plane. I'm going to take an air. I'm going to take a plane. So the, the end result of the experiment was it was easier to talk about feelings than it was to talk about factual stuff. But this was two years ago, and now emojis have, like, totally uh, evolved. I mean, I have Star Wars ones I send to my kids, you know. I mean, so um, just randomly, just like, just shoot them in emoji. They never know what it means. Um, so, <laughs> when you're teenagers, you gotta do something. Um, so, so yeah, so this is what we're evolving to because it, it's universal. It is completely universal. So, and when you're communicating, especially in a globalized society, there's gonna be, seen, this is why we're seeing more symbols. We're gonna have to incorporate more of this. And this is why in the U.S. we're definitely gonna have to incorporate some more. These are, uh, this is, the ADA regulations are coming about accessibility for websites. Uh, what this means is websites are being dubbed public places, especially if you have an e-commerce site. You need to make sure that the public can access it. So I, you know, of course, I, being the lawyer that I formerly was, I delved into a little bit and decided I didn't want to bore you all totally. So I, um, the big things that, that are happening and that you're going to start to see at some of the bigger sites. So visually, uh, for those who are visually impaired, you need to use alt text. You need to have semantically meaningful HTML. One advantage, this gets rid of that keyword stuffing. If you actually have to write actual language that someone's going to say out loud, that helps the quality sites. I think that helps the quality SEO. So make sure you are having language on your site that could be read by one of those programs. Um, this is phenomenal right here. We're seeing this today, having someone close caption as I speak. Um, hopefully, uh, I'm speaking clearly enough, but that's another helpful thing. Uh, colorblind friendly. This is why we underline web links and don't just put the different color because not everybody can see every color, so they do know if it's underlined, it's a link. And that's why I don't underline things that are not links. That drives me nuts. Um, large fonts. We're being able to enlarge the fonts. Responsive design. It's all very important. Uh, motor mobility. Uh, not everybody, as our aging population, will be able to use a mouse. Um, or we want buttons that are really important, very large, so people can hit the buttons, or that they can access and move on your website with a keyboard. 
These are all things that uh, we're going to be requiring this year. It's been backed up to 2018. But if you are designing sites, start thinking about this and how it can be worked in because it's going, especially if you're a public site. Um, auditory closed captions text. Uh, we're seeing this in different places, not just uh, online. I was just saying, I was at the ART where the play waitress and they had the closed captioning on the sides of the theater. And I thought that was really an incredible change. So that's very exciting. We don't want to promote seizures. So no flashing, no, no bright strobe lights happening uh, when you switch to a site. Um, and cognitive intellectual, use plain language. Uh, illustrations, that's what we just saw that's coming. Uh, IKEA has captured that already. Adequate reading time. So if something's automatically moving, a slideshow or something like that, someone with a learning disability might not be able to capture the important information as it rotates. So these are all things we need to be thinking about in the next year or so. But some people are already thinking about it. You know, so when TED Talks first started putting transcripts up there, I thought, like, oh, how did they know that I really wanted to read instead of watch everything because I can read faster than I can watch something. And also, when I read, I am totally focused on that, and I'm not going to be distracted. Like, I, if I listen to a TED Talk, I'll get, oh, something happening over there. So, uh, so it's not just for me, like I thought. Um, it was for all the people out there that might want to read it or have it dictated or, or whatever, or however you might uh, want it. But one thing about when you do accessibility, uh, in any sense of the word, I'm coming out of the commercial real estate space, so when you make accommodations for those who have extra challenges, you are helping more than just those people. Uh, one of the best examples I ever heard was the curb cuts in, uh, like in New York City or in any city where they flatten out the curbs so that uh, wheelchairs can get down and cross the road and then get up and so it's not uh, up and down. But who else uses those curb cuts? I know when I had to push a baby carriage around Boston, boy, did I feel for the people trying to navigate Boston. Um, and I know the push cart vendors in New York that are trying to get those carts across. I've been running down the street to the train station in New York. I had 10 blocks in heels, dragging luggage. I did appreciate those curb cuts. So uh, when you make accommodations for one specific group, you're going to help more people that you haven't even thought about. So that's my plea for doing that, not just because I like to read instead of watch videos. Um, and important things like lazy girl style hacks for looking chic in the heat. Uh, <laughs> admittedly, yes, I do read this over report. Um, view is one page versus uh, swiping. Swiping, some people can't swipe. It's easier for them to scroll and, and, and maneuver differently. So um, these are, you know, these are major blogs, and they're actually starting to accommodate different things. Okay, so once your site's accessible, how do you make sure it's credible. It is such a busy world. Back when I started blogging in 2003, there weren't that many bloggers. Uh, so now people are starting to distinguish between bloggers, and bloggers are the big circle, everybody who blogs, and inside that circle are influencers. So with my toy company, when I was doing research for who we wanted to reach out to, which bloggers, we were looking for influencers. Not just anybody who writes a blog, but somebody who writes blogs that can influence people. And that is what we're looking for. If you have a blog, you're thinking about being an influencer because you're putting your opinion out there because you want to influence somebody. So there's different ways of doing that, and some of these ways are listed up here. Communities. Um, officially, there's communities like Huffington Post, although I'm not sure it really takes too much to write for them anymore, but they used to be a, a community. Uh, Mashable, you know, I mean, they're, they're, if you are writing for an existing community, that gives you some credibility. Not always so much because people are being a little more cynical now. Um, but creating your own community. So on this toy company, we had mommy bloggers who were influencing one set of people, but we also had the homeschoolers. So we're looking at ones that are influencing that community. And those are built up communities. And within those communities, you have people who are writing because they have certain expertise, and you have people who are writing just because something was interesting. And I was thinking about this pretty heavily in the last couple months, because as I said, I was doing an edition, and you get to the end, and you don't have any money, so you have to be the interior designer. I don't know anything about interior design. design. I didn't. I do now. Uh, but I was, must have read every blog, because by the way, uh, Benjamin Moore has like 42 shades of white paint. And uh, I think I can name them all now. But uh, it, it just got so overwhelming, and I was looking for expertise. And so I would end up trusting certain bloggers more than others. So the ones at apartment therapy, they would get a lot of conversation. The ones on house, H-O-U-Z-Z, -Z, 
And um, it eventually led me to this uh, one woman's blog, uh, her name was Maria Killio, and she seemed to be training other designers. So for me, she had such a deep expertise, and it came through uh, on her blog. And yes, she was trying to sell me stuff, and I did break down at midnight one night and buy the $35 ebook. but I realized I was making a big uh, decision on the cost to paint the house, and it, it was too high a ceiling to outside paint, and I'm not going to do that, so I'm going to be stuck with it. So I bought that $35 ebook. But you know what? She had stuff on there that was not on the blog. I actually don't regret that purchase. Uh, so if you have, so if you want to get people interested and you want to push something on, you got to make sure you're holding something back that's not all on the blog that is credible. And when they get it, they don't say, what? I just got the same stuff you had here. So that was one way of looking at expertise. I also was taking the advice of some home do-it-yourself bloggers because they weren't trying to sell me anything. So when they're saying, I like this paint better than that paint, they were not sponsored by one of the paint companies. So it's kind of a balance between it. Because I don't want to discourage you. It's like, I don't want to get out there and, and, and start blogging or writing or, or writing websites because I'm not an expert. Uh, you, can, you can be an expert or, or you can, if you're credible, people will listen to you. Um, the next way to build expertise for your blog is be curators of content. Um, this is what, uh, this is what you can do on your social media feeds. Uh, if you follow me, I, I write about leadership. I, I tweet about leadership. I'll, I'll share articles. I guarantee you I will have read them all before I share them. Uh, and it would also be something that I hadn't heard before. I'm not just going to say, oh, well, Tuesday, I haven't sent anything out yet. OK, there's something on leadership. We'll click. No, it's got to be something new and different. So think about curating your own stuff on the blog or curating other content. Some of the content I trust most was um, New York Times interviewed all the food nutrition es experts at all the blogs to find out what food that they thought was healthy and what's not, and then they graphed it. And I trusted that information more than any individual nutritionist. So collectively, uh, compiling information, uh, Nate Silver is the ultimate example of this. He doesn't run his own polls. He takes a poll of all the polls that are out there, and he can put out the outliers and come up with things. So there's different ways to build credibility for yourself and your organization. Uh, be careful what content you curate. I don't know if anyone agrees with me, but I feel like Mashable has jumped the shark. I mean, I, I don't even click on half their articles, whereas before it used to be so good, and every article was interesting and related, and now it's like, how is this on Mashable? It's a dog doing something, and it's not even that funny. Uh, you know, uh, I'll forgive things for being funny, but... So, so think about curating content, uh, finding the researchers out there, writing your opinions on the research that's already out there, uh, and making sure that research is credible. If you become a trusted resource, you can survive a, a, a lot of, uh, you can distinguish yourself among the crowd. Uh, comments, they do matter. I trusted, uh, when I was going through my research on white paint, uh, I trusted the ones where people were writing in the comments because it created a community. So it goes back to that, it was part of a community. People were actually reading and discussing uh, these things. Sometimes when you read comments on Facebook, uh, you know, I read the comments on Facebook before I read the article, just to make sure it's worth my time because clickbait and all that stuff. So comments do matter. So if you can get some commentary going, although most of the comments now are happening on social media. So we're going to see blogs with zero comments, but then if you go to the company's website, they'll have commentary going on, discussions going on on, on Facebook about that post that they did. So just because it's not on the blog, it doesn't mean there isn't commentary going on. And the best news is there is a flight to quality. Uh, blog posts are getting longer. Uh, last year, the average blog post of the top bloggers was 900 words. We're seeing some fantastic long-form journalism on blogs. The Atlantic uh, Monthly did this great expose of prison systems, private prison systems. That was like a, that was like a slow spotlight series. It was fantastic. Uh, New York Times has done some long-form journalism on there, too. So we are seeing a flight to quality, uh, less keyword stuffing now that Google is corrected for that and the algorithms. So that's good news for all of us. So here's my girl, Maria. Uh, Save me at midnight when I'm trying to figure out. But you know what? If I go to her blog, it's very clean looking. It's got colors on it. I mean, it, it's very relevant and she's very credible. And yes, she was trying to sell me stuff as if I was a designer uh, or interior designer, but you know, she, she did it quite well. I guess she's going to be in Boston next week, actually, for some conference. So next, trends in design. Now, I'm not going to be able to tell you the hot fonts or the hot, you know, design techniques. Um, I know what I like, I know what I don't like, but I'm more looking at like trends that uh, are, are just a bigger picture ones that you can uh, apply down. So images, knowing your audience, and DIFM uh, versus do-it-yourself. And we'll talk about all this real quick. 
Images matter. So now this is my corporate blog. I don't personally run it. I actually have a couple of interns run it, and we are probably, uh, we have gotten awards for being one of the top blogs, and while we are a big company, and I have 1,500 employees at our different franchises, our bigger competitors who we're beating out have 15,000 employees. They have marketing departments that are as big as my entire headquarters, and we are winning with a couple of interns. <laughs> and the thing is that they're using the imagery. We changed our theme, our WordPress theme that we're using, actually. I uh, just couldn't a blog. And actually, all the blogs I think I'm showing today are on WordPress, I think, most of them. Um, so we just added these compelling pictures. And we're getting them, we're making sure we have the rights to them. Uh, Pixa, um, there's a couple of Pixability. Yeah, she's not Pixability. Yeah, or you can go on the Google Images search and look for the open uses and rights to reuse. Uh, so we're very careful doing that. In fact, when I knew one of my speeches was being filmed, we were vetting the pictures. We had to find out. I was talking about WeWork, because we have an office in WeWork, and it's a big commercial real estate topic. And we had to go find a company in Israel who was like, can we use your picture? And I could only get to them through Twitter. It was very funny, but I was uh, too afraid. And they're like, we can't believe you went through this effort. But it's a big deal. So definitely make sure you have all the rights to use the pictures. Uh, there's other sites like PicMonkey and Canvas where you can make, you can make uh, creative pictures yourself. Uh, a little bit, there's templates, there's lots of different things you can use up there. So images really do matter. I think any study you look at, it, it, blog posts and Facebook posts and Twitter posts and any social media posts get between 50 to, to 84% more uh, traffic. So pictures are important. And that's our visual world we're living in. So now when you're designing, and this goes for visual as well as for app designers, um, I use the 220-220 rule. If we're designing something for someone to use on a desktop computer, that's going to be for two-hour attention span. So we can have like, and I'm usually using real estate examples, we can have our complex financial programs that you're going to run because someone's going to sit there for two hours and run it. If you're designing for use on a tablet, that's a 20-minute, an app for a 20-minute attention span. Um, on a phone, it's two minutes. And on a watch, it's 20 seconds. So those are not, you can't take one app or one design and squish it down. This is why responsive design and figuring out what's important to what, uh, and what, where, how your audience is accessing it. So you might want to think about this as attention spans. I mean, for the article, how long is your article going to be? Um, that long form Atlantic article, I read that on my tablet in at least 20 or 30 minute sections because it had a lot of different sections. I would never read it on my phone. Uh, I don't know how my kids can watch TV on the phone, but they do. I mean, but I have an iPad mini and I watch a lot on that. Um, so it, it, you can do that. And I really wanted to watch so badly. I was just telling Rako until I realized I wear my reading glasses now. I'd never be able to see it, you know. And, <laughs> and definitely, uh, you know, so. But, uh, but it's different designs. So there are tracking software. You can find out how people are accessing your site. You know, are they on PCs? Are they on Macs? Are they on mobiles? I mean, uh, responsive design is more important than ever. And here's something that you see uh, somebody acknowledging this, uh, Fast Company. Nine minute read. Have you guys noticed this recently? I just realized it a couple of weeks ago. They put how long the articles are. And that's helpful for me because I'm not going to read that on my phone. And if you would please tell me if you're linking to a video. You know, I always hate when I'm on Facebook or, or, or which I get my news off of Facebook now, which is a big change and a trend. I don't go to uh, the news websites anymore. I, I haven't come to me. But tell them what they're getting into so they know when to read it. So that was an interesting. I didn't have time to research the genesis of that. So finally here, uh, I'm going to talk about DIF and do it for me versus do it yourself and make it yourself. And this is a little bit of a generational conflict going on here. Uh, this was an interesting headline. Home Depot was, you know, they had that boomer crowd before that was expanding their homes and now they're downsizing and they're not going to do it yourself anymore. So they're having to attract a newer audience. Uh, we've also seen the rise of recipes online. No longer do you get just a, you know, easy recipe, a curious recipe. You see these two hands, and they make the they make the pasta, and they make it look so good. Uh, yeah, so so that's just a change. It's become more visual, and it's also generational. Uh, the uh, uh, generation Y and Z are more do it yourself and make it yourself. Although there is an argument. Uh, I love Kara Swisher's statement about San Francisco was that it was assisted living for millennials. Uh, because you can have any service at your home. I mean, walk my dog, wash my dog, uh, you know, take my stuff to storage, uh, anything. You can, you can find it and they can do it in your home. And it's going to come to, uh, when you go to Amazon, 
They come to Amazon. Uh, they now send you a phone. Do, they, do you want someone to assemble that at your home or install it? That was a new change. So that, I think, is catering a little bit to the, the baby boomers crowd. But the younger crowd, so if you're trying to attract a younger crowd, they like to do it yourself or make it yourself. And part of this is the 3D printing coming in and the, just getting more hands-on and crafted. I think that's a really good, uh, fun change. So they, and the reason they really like to do it yourself and make it yourself is because how else could you be more authentic? You made it yourself. It's about authentic. So that's why they're making them on movies, uh, they're on YouTube, they're you know, just jumping out there. Hey, I'm an expert on hair care because I got 30, 3 million views on how to use this new product. So uh, they're just getting out there doing it. So any do-it-yourself stuff, that's a big attractor. So I'm going to wrap up here. So I just write my little pet piece. I have a bunch of bloggers in the room and, and writers and everything. Okay, things I'm so over. And you guys can help me add to this list. Uh, I would like to say like, things I don't want to see anymore. Okay, number one, clickbait. Okay, that is not the funniest video ever. Okay, I mean, you just said that the one before, and it's, I'm just really tired of everything's the best ever, this ever, it's the funniest ever. Okay, we're getting tired of clickbait, and survey shows that it is um, changing, and people are reading the comments first and, and going, is this worth clicking onto? And people are saying no. So, uh, clickbait's hopefully going away. Listicles. Um, I used to like reading the list, then they all seemed redundant, and I was reading a book, and it was about some, and it mentioned a, a character who actually's job was to write the listicles, and they just cannibalize each other. So it's not any new listicles. So uh, listicles, and by the way, I never read one to more than 10. So if you're getting like 23 reasons to do this, I'm already lost on three, okay? So, um, so yeah, listicles are kind of hopefully going to go away, unless they're really quality. Uh, Slideshows. Uh, they slow everything down, they swipe, and... I have two screens at, my, at all times. I'm using two screens. That means I might leave a website up. My old website, I think we actually we still have, no, we got rid of it. We used to have one that would slide and it'd be up there and it would just make me nauseous because it would keep moving and it would be a distraction. So I think we're moving away from that because I do think it's hard to transfer onto mobile and responsive design too. So uh, slideshows. Videos that auto start. Yeah, who, who's with me on this one? All right, thank you. And it's not just because I'm watching videos I shouldn't at work. It's because sometimes I'm going to work-related videos, and all of a sudden it's blaring out there or in my head. I mean, it's, yeah, so videos that auto start are really obnoxious. Um, winning or breaking the internet. Yeah, this drives me crazy. Oh, such and such won the internet. I mean, yeah, no, you can't win the internet. You can't break the internet. Well, you can't break it the way they're talking about the content. And, of course, I'm so over these two. <laughs> But I did do a study a couple years ago on, I did an article about how just mentioning Kim Kardashian could up your hits. I proved that it could. I totally irrelevant hits, but that was the biggest day in, in my website. It was a, a, a social media a consulting agency website. And I said, if I just mentioned Kim Kardashian a couple times, and sure enough, automated went up. So, so I don't know, anything else anybody so over? Great text. What is it? Great text. Great text? Yes, I totally agree with you that, and actually we have some of that on our website, guilty as charged. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm guilty of that one too, but I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, it was vertically shot videos on phones, so that when you look this way, you get the black on the both sides. Modals. Yes, absolutely. The pop-ups where you have to click close and when they move close on you and it's not in the upper right. And that's going to have some accessibility issues, so that, that might go away. And so some of the stuff is, it's a flight to quality. And by the way, I will argue there's one person that did win the internet. I think that was Chewbacca Mom. <laughs> she wasn't trying. That was the best part. She wasn't even trying. Uh, but those are great things. But I think some of these are going to go away as we get more sophisticated and, we, and you all get more sophisticated and, and you make the changes. So... Um, I just want to say thank you for having me here today. Um, it was fun to talk with you all, and I'll be around for a little bit because I'd love to hear your thoughts on what I have to say because you're in the trenches more than I am these days. I used to be there, uh, uh, but now I, have, uh, I get to read what you all produce. So I want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure.